Peter Van Inwagen talks about the mystery of metaphysical freedom. And in part one here, we're going to set up what this mystery is before we really get into the details of the mystery in part two. And first of all, we have to think about freedom in, in terms of what are we really interested in when we're talking about free will. There, there seems to be a sense of freedom that is negative, and this is important. This is a freedom from constraints, and the constraints might involve political constraints, you know, laws that restrict what you can do and can't do, psychological restraints just in your makeup, what if someone is, uh, has a fear of snakes that they won't be going near snakes, you know, those kinds of things, economic freedoms, I like the freedom to uh, hop on a private jet and fly to Africa whenever I want. So we all have these various constraints that are negative, right? They restrict our freedom in some sense. But there's also a different sense of freedom, not one that's negative, but a more positive one. And it's this metaphysical sense that is especially interesting. So what are we talking, well, why is it especially interesting? It's, you know, metaphysicians in philosophy of religion, for example, are concerned about the consistency between the free will of a human and God's foreknowledge. So it's that kind of metaphysical sense that we're worried about. If we're talking about constraints, it's no big deal. Um, Aristotle was concerned about the problem of future contingents, things that might go one way or another way. And so in De Interpretatione and other places, he addresses his concerns about that. Also in philosophy of religion, we're concerned about the problem of evil. And typically a response to that is related to the free will of human beings. That's the metaphysical sense that we're talking about there. So it's this metaphysical sense that is especially interesting for philosophers. And I think for most people who have thought about freedom, even if you're not reflecting that in great detail philosophically. And again, metaphysical freedom is not negative. So we have to have a positive account. So uh, if here are the problems, if you think of it just as negative. So if, if one assumes that that's all freedom is, it's this freedom from constraint, this, this negative freedom from account, then you're clearly going to have a, an account that is consistent with determinism. And this is certainly the case with uh, soft determinist or compatibilist uh, people like Hobart and Stace, who, whose videos I've discussed elsewhere, uh, so whose views I've discussed elsewhere in other videos, I should say, uh, we have that negative account there's really not a reason to think that there's going to be any fewer obstacles if determinism is true there. And so you get compatibilism fairly easily and compatibilists, generally speaking, that is broadly speaking, conceive of freedom as freedom from constraint. But this positive notion of freedom, the metaphysical freedom as Van Inwagen calls it, is the freedom that's typically expressed when we use the word can when we say I can do something and so let's explore that a little bit more the, this use of can so typically we say I can it's going to imply a positive ability to do something right to to be able to accomplish something to make a choice to take a certain path now can can be used in different ways so uh, but there are also other words and phrases that can also be used to talk about metaphysical freedom. So we don't have to use the word can, uh, we could use a phrase like is able to or had a choice about, that seems to imply options here. Within his power seems to imply an ability that we have, right, the, a positive account. Now Van Inwagen points out there is an odd feature of our language when we say something like of his own free will, we're actually typically talking about freedom from constraint. You know, did he do it of his own free will or was he forced to do it? We're, that is bringing in a concept of constraint. So words like can, phrases like is able to or had a choice about or within one's power 
these are the kinds of ideas we have with metaphysical freedom. So you could have constraints, all right, but still have a positive ability to accomplish something. So in other words, some constraints can be overcome. And if you can't overcome the obstacle, then you lack an ability to do something. It depends on to what degree this constraint restricts your activity. So some constraints can be overcome, others can't. Metaphysical freedom is, again, a positive account. It's an ability to do something. Now, we've talked about incompatibilism and how it uses that idea of freedom from constraint, that negative idea. Um, incompatibilists typically think of freedom um, as an ability to add to the past. At least that's one way that Van Inwagen describes it. So the past is done, it, it's a certain way, and then we can add to it. We can decide which direction things go from here. Now, if all we can do is add, all we can add to the past, rather, is what is already determined by the laws of nature and the state of the world in the past, then we really don't have any ability to do other than what we're already determined to do. That's determinism. And in that case, we're not free, says Van Enwagen, who clearly is an incompatibilist. So the incompatibilist view, of course, is determinism is incompatible with metaphysical freedom. And I'm going to briefly review why uh, Van Inwagen thinks that's the case in just a moment. But let's go on to broadly talk about, introduce this idea of mystery, right, which is driving these uh, two videos. Uh, what Van Inwagen says is that each position in the free will debate, and there are many, um, sometimes you just think of a couple or three, but I, I would say there are at least six that I would identify. Each of them has to embrace a mystery, according to Van Inwag. What he says, though, so that includes libertarianism, and he is one, uh, but what he says is that the libertarian position has a mystery that is more palatable than the other positions. Now, other libertarians like Timothy O'Connor says, it's not as mysterious and problematic as you may think. Libertarian has an account that we can use of what's going on with free will. Uh, Van Inwagen is not so uh, positive about that, that development of agent causation, for example. So there's this visual picture of determinism and freedom, the idea that we have forking paths in front of us. So I've described that in my uh, preliminary uh, basic views on, on free will videos that I've created there, where you have these paths that are open to you. You could do one thing at this time, and you could also do something else. And that's the kind that we need for moral responsibility. So if someone's morally responsible for stealing something, we have we envision them as being in a situation where they could go ahead and commit the theft, or they could have done otherwise. They could have restrained from stealing what they did. And we assume that that option was in place when we attribute moral responsibility to the individual. So that's an intuitive picture. Um, that's the one that we have when we're talking about moral responsibility. It includes what we might call genuine alternatives, right? Legitimate, genuine, open paths where the future is not already limited to one path. Now, if determinism is true, right, this, there are no actual forking paths. It's, it's merely the illusion of forking paths that we think when we're making a decision, there might be options in front of us, but really there's not. There's only one way that things would go. And to introduce this concept of being rewound, which we'll talk a lot more about in part two, if the world were rewound to a previous state by some miracle, right, somehow it would do that, uh, then history would repeat itself. If determinism is true, exactly the same way from that point forward, right? Nothing would change. 
Now let's go ahead and, and look at why Van Inwagen thinks that freedom is incompatible with determinism. And so I explore this much more thoroughly in a different video. So here I'm going to go pretty quickly. So if determinism is true, there is a necessary truth that if P sub prime here, that would be the all of the states of the nature of the entire universe, right? The state of the entire universe in the past. That, that's why it's P. And L, L is all of the laws of nature, right? A conjunction, a very large conjunction of all of the laws of nature. So if you take the state of the world and distant past laws of nature, they're both true, then P, when P is any true proposition whatsoever, such as you are watching this video right now. So any proposition would be coming from, uh, dependent on the state of the world and distant past and the laws of nature. And necessarily, if the, we have the distant past, we then, if we have the laws of nature, then P, you're watching this video. And then he introduces this idea of an untouchable truth. And if something's necessary, it seems like it's going to be an un untouchable truth. So clearly it's an untouchable truth that is something no one can do anything about that the past is the way that it was. No one can do anything about the fact that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, for example. That's an untouchable truth. We can't do anything about it. And it's an untouchable truth that we have this conditional. If P is true, if the past was the certain way that it was, then if L is true, then P is true. Okay? Hence, it's an untouchable truth that if L is true, then P, again, we're assuming determinism throughout here. Um, and this is what we call the conditional rule now. If we have, it's an untouchable truth that if L is true, then P, and it's an untouchable truth that L is true, right? We can't do anything about the laws of nature. They are what they are. Hence, it's an untouchable truth that P, and that keep in mind that's the conditional rule right there. Those three steps uh, where we take an untouchable conditional and then we say the antecedent is untouchable, we conclude that the consequent is untouchable. And if you have that, then if determinism is true, we don't have any free will because this is generalized over any true proposition whatsoever, like you're watching this video was untouchable for you, you could not have done anything about that fact. Now that seems like you're not free. Okay, so this brings a mystery for compatibilism to mind. And the compatibilist seems to, in order to avoid this argument for incompatibilism, what they need to do, it seems, is to reject the conditional rule. The other steps in that argument that we just went through seem to be impeccable. So the only place, the weak spot that Van Anwagen says is to reject that conditional rule, those three steps that we just went over. And, but that would be utterly mysterious, says Van Anwagen. It just doesn't make sense that you could reject that. And the libertarian, of course, accepts incompatibilism and also claims that we have free will. That is, we have some choices and so the libertarian is going to say determinism is false, right? If determinism is true, we have no free will. We do have free will, so determinism is false. But, so that's the issue for the compatibilist. But metaphysical freedom itself is also mysterious, according to Van Inwagen. And that's what we're going to address in part two.